Let us hear now the words from the Apostle Paul written to the church in Corinth as contained in 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous in every way. Such generosity produces thanksgiving to God through us. Your ministry of this service to God's people isn't only fully meeting their needs, but it is also multiplying in many expressions of thanksgiving to God. They will give honor to God for your obedience to your confession of Christ's gospel. They will do this because this service provides evidence of your obedience and because of your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone. They will also pray for you and they will care deeply for you because of the outstanding grace that God has given to you. Thank God for God's gift that words cannot describe. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Y'all know me, I like stories. And I found this story, and at first it sounded to me like a story I needed to say for Thanksgiving time. But the more I thought about it, I realized that we are to be thankful people 365 days of the year. And the more I thought about it, our thanksgiving is rooted in something very deep that we need to be reminded of all the time. This is how the story goes. It was just about Thanksgiving Day, and a first grade teacher gave to her class what she thought would be a fun assignment. She asked them all to draw a picture of something for which they were thankful very much like many of you have been asked throughout this stewardship season to write on those little balloon cutouts, things that are blessings in your life for which you are thankful. Now, this teacher was considering that many of the children in her classroom were economically disadvantaged, but still she figured most of them would celebrate Thanksgiving with turkey and dressing and all of those wonderful things around a Thanksgiving meal table. So she thought the pictures would show her a Thanksgiving meal table. And pretty much most of the students' art did that. But one little boy named Douglas was different. And she could tell all along throughout the school year that Douglas was a little bit different. Douglas was one of those children who just looked like he had a really tough home life. He often looked very sad at school. He was frail. and She could only imagine what his home life must be like. She could just see the sadness behind his eyes. And sure enough, his picture was very different. When he turned in his picture, his picture was simply of a pair of hands, not holding anything. Well, when the teacher picked up all of the pictures and showed them to the classroom so that they could see what their classmates had drawn pictures of, when all the other children saw Douglas's picture of those two empty hands, their imaginations went wild. They had to guess and try to decide whose hands those were that he depicted. Some of them said, well, those must be the hands of a farmer because the farmer's the one who plants all the seeds and helps grow all the food that we're going to eat on Thanksgiving. So he is thankful for the farmers. And other children said, well, no, no, those must be the hands of the police officers in our community who are trying to keep us all safe so that we can have a wonderful holiday celebration. And other children 
who must have been good church attenders, said, surely those are the hands of God because God is the one who provides all our blessings. And that's why we say a prayer on Thanksgiving Day, to give God thanks. And the teacher looked around and she looked at little Douglas and she said, Douglas, whose hands are those? Douglas, very shy, turned away, didn't want to look his teacher in the eye as he said, they're yours, teacher. And when he said that, the teacher's mind was flooded with all the times that little Douglas had been left behind when the other kids rushed out the door for recess. And the teacher would say, Douglas, take my hand. Let's go on outside. And she thought about all the times that Douglas struggled with his work in school. And she would place her hand on his hand and say, let me show you how to hold your pencil right. She thought about all the times that Douglas just stood by her side out at recess as the other children were playing. And he reached up and grabbed her hand. She patted his hand to assure him he was not alone and that he was loved. Now I share that story with you because I think it's not just a story about thankfulness. It's also a story about teachers and parents and mentors and neighbors that we just sang about in Hesu, Hesu, fill us with your love. Show us how to serve. It's about reaching our hands out to people who are hurting in this community and how important and significant it is to touch other people's lives with our hands. We may not always hear people say thank you for the things that we do. And we may not always know how significant little gestures like reaching out your hand may mean to someone. But they can mean all the difference in the world. Some of you may recall that back around Super Bowl Sunday, Y'all supported us in participating in the He Gets Us campaign. The He Gets Us campaign was a national campaign that continues to go on where many affiliates like Church Care's website offers to people in the community who are hurting, who are feeling hopeless, a way to connect with a local church. Just this morning, I received another text message from someone, and part of that text message from this person in our community said that they are feeling hopeless and alone, and they have no one to talk to. I received that text message as we were in the car driving here to church today, and I looked at Richard and I said, it breaks my heart. I'm reading a text message from someone who has no one to talk to. What a gift of reaching out our hand is to people like that person on the other side of that text message. Inviting them into a community that is loving and accepting and affirming a safe place for this person to share their sorrows and their pains and to be reminded of the promises of Scripture that God never leaves us abandoned. You know, there's a theory in science called the butterfly effect. Anybody ever heard of the butterfly effect? Wonderful. I'm glad. And I'm glad several of you have. Yeah. Because the butterfly effect... You are spot on, spot on. And I'm going to say that again so the people online can hear it as well. 
It is a chain reaction. You are absolutely right. Something small as a butterfly flapping their wings on one side of the world can affect the weather patterns and either cause or stop a hurricane or a tornado on the other side of the world. It's something that was a phrase that was coined in the 1960s by Edward Lorentz, and he was a meteorology professor, and he wanted to try to help understand weather patterns and predict the weather in the future. And what he determined in his analysis and research is that it's virtually impossible to predict the weather. We all knew that from listening to weather reports anyway, didn't we? But he was able to determine the reason for that. And he said the reason is simply because there are too many minute variances that can be a pivot point to change the weather. Minute variances like the fluttering of a butterfly's wings. Well, in 2004, there was a Hollywood movie starring Ashton Kutchner and Amy Smart by that name, The Butterfly Effect. And that movie, yes, that's right. That movie actually showed how when you do small things and change small things in your life, how it can have a lasting effect on other people. So imagine with me a school teacher who will give encouragement to a student in her class and help that student to see something in their own self that gives them the courage to then befriend another student who is going through a tough time. Or think about a young person who attends youth group right here at Washington Street United Methodist Church, and Sarah Kate leads them in a Sunday school youth group Bible study lesson on Esther and how Esther was able to have the courage to speak to authority. And that young person has the courage then to speak up themselves, to speak up and to reach out. Think about the power of that, the power of reaching out when we do those small things. Or think about an elderly person in our congregation who volunteers volunteers to work with children in local schools, reading to those children, and how those children then develop a love for reading and writing, and maybe that child then becomes a poet laureate. Or maybe one of you will say something to someone that encourages their choice in a career and encourage them to go on to receive extended education. And they hear God calling them and labeling gifts in their lives, motivating them to enter the political system in the United States and positively changing the trajectory of United States politics. Amazing. But it can happen. Small acts of reaching out to others in care and concern. Here's the thing. Everything that we do this week, our actions, our decisions, our choices will have a ripple effect of consequences foreseen and unforeseen. We may never know what our words, our actions, our decisions what kind of ripple effect they have on other people and other situations on down the line. So the question isn't whether we will have an impact on others. The question is what kind of difference will we make? Will it be positive or will it be negative? In the scripture lesson that we just read today, the Apostle Paul is reminding the people in Corinth and he is reminding us that our blessings have a ripple effect that when we are generous in serving others and giving to others and doing good in this world, following God's call in our life, it doesn't just bless the people right in front of us that we intend to bless, but it has a ripple effect. Stop and ponder a moment 
about the numbers of people who are fed each and every week in our soup cellar. That food is not simply nourishing individual lives, but think about how many lives are touched by each individual who walks into that soup cellar. How a kind word and a conversation would have a ripple effect with another conversation that they have with someone else who is homeless on down the line, who tells them, I found a place where I belong and where I have received bread and nurture and a place of belonging and have been reminded that I am a valued child of God and I have a purpose in this life. My friends, some of our actions may be big and bold, but some of our actions may be small and hardly noticeable, but they will all have a ripple effect in this world. And that's what we celebrate in stewardship season. We are here today to participate in our annual ritual of making pledges of our time and our talent and our finances to share our blessings to release them in ways that will have a ripple effect in this world, touching and affecting lives that we may never know about. We're releasing our blessings to make ministry happen. But let me be clear about that phrase, what that phrase, making ministry happens, means. It means that we are facilitating opportunities for God's Holy Spirit to touch lives and open up God's possibilities in the lives of others to help them to feel God's grace at work in their lives. The activity of ministry, touching lives of others in this family of faith, makes a big difference in this world. Now, you heard me several months ago tell you the story about Ruby Bridges the little six-year-old girl who on November the 14th of 1960 had to be escorted to school by federal marshals because she was the first black student to integrate public schools. That was in the state of Louisiana. Norman Rockwell painted a portrait of her and that image was called The Problem we all live with the problem of racism in this world. People who have listened to Ruby Bridges over the years speak about her life and particularly about that time in her life have been fascinated by her capacity to forgive. But she tells everyone who will listen that she did not realize at the time how unusual that was. She didn't think she was doing anything amazing by forgiving the people who were yelling at her and spitting towards her. It was just part of who she was and the way she grew up. But it finally dawned on her when she was about 30 years old what a gift that was and how important it was that she always forgave. She said when she was 30 years old, someone in her family did something that hurt her very, very deeply, and she was angry and bitter against that family member until one day she realized she needed to practice her faith and that her faith in Jesus Christ told her to forgive as we have been forgiven, and she needed to let go of that hurt and that pain and forgive that family member. And so she did, she relied on her faith to help her forgive that family member. She knew all of her life, ever since she was a little girl, that the power to forgive frees our spirits to live the abundant life that God has called us to live. And where did that come from? That knowledge about forgiveness, it came from the little church that she believed in, the little church that she attended, the little church that provided for her the influence that God can do the impossible in our lives and when we turn our lives over to God, when we allow the Spirit to give us the power and the grace to do what we think we cannot do on our own. And my friends, 
That's the kind of church Washington Street United Methodist Church is. We're the kind of church that helps people to see the possibilities that God has for their life. If you look at the little children who came up here for the children's sermon today, those beautiful children that Dane so beautifully led in our children's message today, you'll see the lessons of love and possibility that our children are learning from people like Dane and Susan and Ann and Beth and Lisa and others who give our children's moments each and every week. From people like Lee and Eleanor and Mary and Kathy and Tommy who lead our children's Sunday school classes and teach our children about forgiveness, about grace, about mercy, about justice, about love and about being peacemakers. Do you know that Sarah Kate has told me that it takes an extraordinary number of volunteers each and every Sunday to staff our children's Sunday school class, to lead children's moments, to handle children's church, for when the children leave children's moments, they go out into another room and they continue their lessons. And that there are adult volunteers needed on Sunday afternoon to lead our youth Bible study time and fellowship time. Adult volunteers make those lessons possible for little children like Ruby Bridges. How do you think the activities here at Washington Street are shaping and molding the lives of children and youth? young people who are experiencing the blessings that this church provides? And how many guests do you realize are attending our worship services each and every Sunday, very first time visitors who come into the doors of this community of faith and they discover hope when they have felt hopeless. They discover a place of belonging they are reassured of who they are and who God is and that they have a place. That old wounds are healed and they receive that balm of Gilead, that healing touch of Jesus where others have wounded them. They are reminded that they are God's beloved creation. A few Sundays ago, our elected leaders of the church got together here in one of the classrooms upstairs. And we talked about how we are living out the mission of this church, the mission of this church that you see on the front of your bulletin each and every week, the mission of the church that says we are open and affirming and reaching out with the love of Christ, that we believe in the traditions of the church, but we also believe in reaching people in ways that the world needs to be reached today. And we talked about what we believe God is calling us to do in 2024. What are the things we're doing now that are effective in making disciples of Jesus Christ and proclaiming love and peace and hope and joy in this world? And what are the new things that God is calling us to do what do we need to do in youth ministry and children's ministry and worship ministry and music ministry and small group ministry? And then what are those things going to take in numbers of volunteers and in finances? And I won't lie to you. It's going to take a lot. We dreamed big. But our God is a God of big possibilities. And our community is in a lot of need. Our children and our youth need a community like Ruby Bruce's had. And who in that little church, I mean, think about it. Think about that little church that she attended. I imagine in that little church about this time of year, every year, someone stood up like I've stood up and like... Um, we had Christine Haight stand up. Somebody stood up in that little church and said, Okay, folks, these are our plans for the church in the new year, and we're going to need volunteers, and we're going to need your finances, and we're going to need your talents. We're going to need all these things to pay the bills, to keep the light on, to pay for the staff, and to have children's Sunday school, youth group, adult Bible studies, so on and so forth. So what do you say, folks? What are you going to do? Will you pledge? And I bet you, 
when the people walked out of that church every year after that Sunday speech was over, they said, oh, I'm so glad that's over with for another year. That was the most unspiritual worship service I've been to. Maybe next Sunday the preacher will finally get back to a spiritual, biblically-based sermon that means something to me. But my friends, I feel sure that the people in that little church also made a commitment to the ministries. And because they did, they released blessings, blessings that touched and shaped and molded a little girl to take bold and courageous steps that indeed changed history. And it can happen over and over again in a community of faith a community of faith that helps people find hope and gives hope, that helps create messengers and ambassadors of peace and justice, mercy and grace in this world. And I want you to know, I don't say it enough, but I'm proud of you. I went to a clergy meeting this week and someone asked me, they said, how are things at Washington Street? And I said, oh, I am blessed. They are a congregation of God-loving people who truly give their hearts, their minds, and their spirits to the calling God has placed on their life. I had a doctor's appointment this week, tightness in my jaw, and the doctor saying, oh, well, you know, it's probably stress. What's your church like? Now, why did he think? <laughs> I said, I said, my church is great, and, and, my, and my staff is outstanding. And he said, oh, well, if you've got a good staff, I mean, that's it right there. Cause of stress is probably because you're taking care of an aging mother who's falling and having difficulties. And I said, yes. But praise God for my community of faith who understands that and who loves me and loves my family and loves my mother. And we're not in this alone. Beautiful things happen in this community of faith all the time. All the time. You make it happen regularly. That ripple effect is felt in this community. It happens when you volunteer in the soup cellar to provide those meals to people who are experiencing food insecurity. It happens when you allow this ministry to shape and form young lives through the many ministries led by Sarah Kate. It happens when you send cards to members in this congregation who are homebound or experiencing grief or illness. It happens when you provide your time to be a circle of welcome to refugees in this country and it happens when you offer meals to foster families or provide child care for foster families sponsored by Epworth Children's Home it happens here all the time you know some of the most beautiful words in the English language come in small small phrases three or four words I'll go with you I'm on my way I've got your back here, take my hand. I'm right here with you. I love you. When you're scared, when you're insecure, when you're lost, when you're hurting, those are the kind of words we want to hear. Those are the kind of words we need to hear. Amen. We need the reassurance that we are not alone in this world. And those hands are all around this community reaching out, saying, take my hand. Tell me you're on your way. Tell me you've got my back. Tell me you are here. Tell me that you love me. Tell me that God loves me. They are reaching out for support and comfort, emotional, mental, physical, and spiritual healing. And they are stretched out to us. And you might ask, why are they stretched out to us? They are stretched out to us because we are known as the followers of Jesus Christ. 
the followers of the one who held the hands and who holds our hands. May we have the courage and the strength to so live as we fill out our ministry menus and our pledge cards this day and in the days ahead. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.